Hi, and welcome to Factaganda number two. Just one, two. Um, this is, uh, why are there still chimps, I believe? Yes, uh, recently I had somebody ask if, uh, if humans evolved from chimps, why are there still chimps? Okay, so many things wrong with this question. Let's start here. First of all, humans did not evolve from chimps. Uh, humans and chimps evolved from a predecessor, sort of a proto-hominid uh, that existed, you know, millions of years ago. And uh, we are both branches from that one animal who isn't around anymore. Happy? Um, no, of course you're not. So, uh, to give a little bit more of a detailed answer, um, what we're looking at is a, a function of selection. Okay, um, we uh, we and chimps both evolved from this this proto hominid, mostly because we both had different paths. Uh, chimps went up into the you know still kind of left hung out in the trees, hung out with trees at least, if not in them. Uh, and for the most part, we're vegetarians and opportunistic scavengers. That is to say, you know, hey, if a deer comes by and drops dead in front of you, you're going to eat it. Um, whereas humans took a different path, you know, because of our longer hair and our smelly armpits and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, our ability to, to walk upright for extended periods of time, it gave us an advantage of, uh, in oddly enough, running. Um, Humans, historically speaking, uh, have been able to run down most of their prey without the use of tools, in fact. Uh, a, a human chasing a horse uh, may have to go for a while, but they can outrun the horse at full speed and cause, him, cause his heart to explode. And that's basically how humans started hunting um, until, until we started uh, hanging out with dogs, really. And, uh, and then it's possible that either we taught them or they taught us, or I'm not really sure, uh, but things changed. Tools had a lot to do with it, too. We started using tools a little more aggressively, and when we had teaching rather than uh, observing. And that's one of the biggest things that separates us from the chimps, is that chimps will observe somebody else doing something and then copy them, whereas we develop the capacity to teach abstractly without having that task being right there and then be able to you know continue with that task okay so but that still doesn't really answer the question does it why are there still chimps um from an evolutionary standpoint uh, what this question is really asking is about evolutionary pressure and evolutionary pressure works a little something like this. Say so you have uh, like a flock of birds, okay? And some of them are red, some of them are yellow, some of them are green, some of them are blue, whatever. And their only predator is a type of cat, okay? Now, this type of cat prefers the color red, okay? So, uh, when it jumps into a circle and it sees blue birds and green birds and yellow birds and red birds and whatnot, it will almost invariably choose the reddest of the reds to attack first. This is what we call a selective pressure. The closer your color is to red, the more likely you are to be caught by the cat uh, when it pounces. Um, this means that there, are, there will be fewer red birds. Now, this is not to say that the cat couldn't jump into a flock of blue birds and pick the green one. Or something like that. Not saying that. Just saying that red birds, for the most part, are going to get eaten by the cats, and all the other colors will not. Okay. This is a selective pressure. This prevents red birds from continuing on. They cannot, you know, they cannot eat. They cannot procreate. They cannot provide young to the next generation. And without that capability, procreation. They cannot pass on their genes. So, without being able to pass on their genes, they die off. And if the red coloration is genetically bound, then the red color goes away with them as well. 
Okay. So now we have no red birds. We have orange and purple, and the cat starts going for those and keeps selecting. And really, the blue birds get a free ticket the whole time uh, because they're way over on the other side of the side. And the yellow birds, too, they're kind of like digging it. You know, the green birds, they're the ones that, like, mm, yeah, can't, can't see me. Okay. Um, so, so. Now, in this particular example, that, that's just that's a that's a negative pressure, but there are so many other pressures involved with getting to the point of passing your genes on. You know, you have to survive childbirth. You need to be able to eat all the way up until the point where you can replicate, and then replication takes basically one of two forms. Although that's not really the complete answer, uh, but basically, either you divide or, and that's mostly single cell animals, or you have some sort of sexual replication. With mammals and lizards and birds, for the most part, anything big, um, sexual replication is really the way because that allows a mixing of genes and it's the strongest method of, uh, of replicating. There are a few multicellular creatures um, that can do either. Uh, but those are more the exception than the rule. So um, one primary pressure against mating often comes within uh, the, uh, the, the species itself. Uh, think of peacocks, okay? Peahens started seeing a lot of peacocks, and they're like, eh, eh. <laughs> show me some good. And then the one guy stands up and he's got this tiny little fan of feathers behind him. They're like, ooh, that's cute. Give me some of that. So, you know, his tail gets him more tail, if you get my meaning. Um, and then over the years, you know, he, he has the biggest tail in the flock, so he gets to get tail from peahens. And, um, and so on and so on and so on. And eventually we have these peacocks with these huge elaborate tails that are actually in and of themselves a, a hindrance to survival. You know, the long tail means that a, a predator could step on them and hold them down while they, you know, nom, nom, nom. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe they, maybe they don't help so much with flight as they could. You know, they weigh a lot. There's a lot of chemicals involved. They've got to have a good diet you know, to make that brilliant color display happen. So uh, this is a different kind of selective pressure. Um, and that's a really common one. And, and then, of course, one of the biggest selective pressures in nature is uh, competition, you know. Um, now, the peacocks themselves, they have sexual competition for the peahens, but uh, you can have competition for so many other things, land, food sources, etc. Now, like I said, the chimps, they're vegetarians. For the most part, humans are not that much interested in vegetables. Um, sorry, but it's true. Um, they see it, we, ha we have as a race, as a species, seen vegetables as sort of the emergency food, uh, whereas meat has always been prime number one. And that may have contributed something to our evolution, uh, specifically uh, big brains and, and whatnot. Hard to tell. Jury's still out on that one. So uh, for a long time, chimps went their way, eating the vegetarian, you know, vegetarian delight. Humans went another way, eating more omnivorous meat-based diets. Okay? So no competition, no competition for food there. They both had limited tool use. Chips still do. Humans went a little farther. And, uh, and so there wasn't any competition until humans evolved to such a massive level that, um, uh, that they started impinging on the, on the chimps' uh, breeding grounds and whatnot. Now we have conflict. So that's really why there's still chimps around, because they went a different way from our ancestors, who, under the pressure of these two sources, went off. And that's it for Fact Again at number two. We love you, Dr. Kiki. And uh, shout-outs to Lacey Green and Jacqueline and...